Thanks for being here. Subscribe to Cheating Stories Best, so you don't miss new stories. The wife learned how to play video games better than the husband. Can this be the case or did someone teach the wife? In today's story we find out. Have a good time. It was a normal Saturday afternoon in the suburbs. Well, maybe normal for everyone else, but I was out of luck. I was having a garage sale. I hate damn garage sales, and like most men, I'd rather just throw all that junk away. But my wife insisted, even after I told her that we didn't need the money. She immediately responded that we could donate the money to the school our children go to. She is one of the PTA organizers and is truly dedicated to making the school a better place. In fact, she's as obsessed with the PTA as I am with my car. So here I am, lying in a hammock in the backyard, relaxing before Sunday. Sunday is an important day for me. I'm planning on running a marathon in the fall, so I usually spend Sunday mornings on my longest run of the week. It's usually between 18 and 24 miles, so I'm useless for most of the day, at least until sunset when the yard becomes shady. I feel a huge surge of energy, which I use to wash the car. Here's my car in the garage, a 29 Mustang GT with bullet wheels and a Magnaflow exhaust system. After my wife, she's my baby, more precisely, before my wife, she was my baby. You may have noticed that we don't have a garage sale to clean out my garage. No, my garage is spotless, you could eat right off the floor, and there's even a TV. Damn, here they come. I closed my eyes and hoped they would go away, but no. Sorry, sir, said the young man, his girlfriend, or perhaps his wife, holding onto his hand like a lifeline. They both had that damn were young, smart, and in love look on their faces. You mispriced the Gamers Master X Station dual screen video game system, $50 just can't be the right price. I think you meant $500, right? He asked. Both 3D monitors are included, I said. Plus, I'm adding all the games, headsets, and extra controllers. You get all this for $500, I said. His face lit up like it was Christmas. The dual 3D monitors alone cost $300 a piece, and the system should cost at least $400. The games are $60 each. Are you sure you're selling all this for $50? No, I said sharply. Cost $50 bucks. Take it or leave it. His girlfriend poked him in the ribs with her elbow, but he was no fool. Does it work? He asked, looking at me with suspicion. It's been used for less than a month. It's in almost perfect condition, I said. Of course, it works. Look, if you don't want it, I'm sure someone will buy it. It belonged to your child, and he ran away or went to school or something, he asked. No, I said. It was mine. Then why are you selling it so cheap, he asked. I shrugged inside. This is one of the reasons I hate damn garage sales. Everyone can't just get a good deal, they definitely need to know the history and origin of every damn thing. In fact, getting rid of the gaming system was one of the reasons we were having the garage sale in the first place. I sat down and pointed to the set of furniture on my terrace. I grabbed a couple of beers for him and his girlfriend and a Pepsi for myself and started telling them the sad story of how video games almost ruined my life. My name is Perry Tyler. Okay, no dumb questions. I'm not him. I'm not a huge black guy who dresses like a woman and makes movies. My name was Perry Tyler long before anyone had heard of it. Anyway, I have a degree in manufacturing engineering from the University of Michigan and I work for Thompson Manufacturing as a chief CNC programmer. I have a cozy home in the suburbs of Michigan, not far from Detroit. When this story began, I had been married to Denise Kowalski for about 10 years. We were happy, or so I thought. We had everything that would seem to mean happiness in our time. We weren't rich, but we weren't hungry either. Like most Americans, we were in the middle of an economic war. Denise and I were complete opposites in appearance and physicality. She peaked early, and I peaked late. I mean, the first few years after college were her best. Denise was never a stunning beauty, but she was attractive. Her average-looking face was framed by long, shiny brown hair that made her look more beautiful than she really was. She wasn't a monster, but that hair made her look much prettier. Her body wasn't like the girls from Baywatch either, 
but she had beautiful legs. This probably caused most guys not to notice that her stomach was a little loose, even in her 20s, which is a very bad sign. Those breasts also made most guys, myself included, not notice that she had what was called a white girl butt. This is the type of butt that practically does not stand out, it's like her lower back just connects to her legs without any protrusion. It's strange, but this trait is almost never found in the current generation of women. I think maybe it's similar to the Renaissance when Rubenesque women were in fashion. What is and isn't desirable in women changes. In the 21st century, we seem to prefer women with a little more noticeable curves. Overall, I, on the other hand, was a typical nerd during and after college. I was thin, awkward, and wore huge glasses. I was socially awkward and incredibly shy. I was also hopelessly in love with Denise. The first few years after college were difficult for most of us. Denise got a job as a waitress, and I started my current job. I made good money almost from the start and slowly overcame my social phobias. I started as a CNC operator, gradually moved to a setter, and then became a programmer. Each promotion brought new responsibilities and more money. Meanwhile, I was still in touch with some friends from college. Denise and I talked a lot over the years but never met. We grew closer every year until we finally started dating. Things quickly became serious between us. Denise was the first woman to allow me access to her body. I mean, I had a night before her, but it was usually in a hurry, in the back seat of a car or in the dorm while my roommates were away. Denise and I had our own apartments, and we could enjoy. After a year of dating, I noticed a few things. First of all, Denise was simply my best friend. Whenever I was away from her, I was miserable. She felt the same way, so I asked her to marry me. She looked at me as if I was talking about someone else. I think she saw a lot of old maids in the restaurants where she worked and assumed that she would become one. She didn't even accept my offer right away. She asked me why I wanted to marry her. You already have a night with me regularly, she said. You know that I will give you as much as you want even if we don't get married, so why would you marry me? I looked her straight in the eyes. Denise, I've always liked you, even before you noticed me. I dreamed about you. Now that we've spent some time together, I've noticed that I have a pretty hard time when you're not around. It's not just your chest or intim, Denise. I want to spend my whole life with you. Although you are my best friend, I don't want us to be just friends, and I'm scared to think that one day some other guy could take you away from me. I love you, Denise. God, why didn't you just start with that last part, she said. Of course, I'll marry you, Perry, but don't underestimate yourself. I know you think you didn't have a chance with me before, but you did. Being with you is great for me, too. A lot of the guys I dated before you were only interested in night. You were the only one who really took the time to get to know me, and even after we started having an intimate, you were still there and still kind to me. I would never let you go, and I will never let you go. I love you, too. So, after ten years of marriage, we were happy, or so I thought. The past few years had brought us many blessings. We had two sons. Bobby, a mischievous five-year-old boy, and Johnny, his little brother who was three. We waited until we were financially stable before having children. We had a beautiful house, two cars, a swimming pool, and regular vacations. We had everything we needed to be happy. Of course, in ten years, we had become completely different people. Denise seemed shorter and fuller. Although she wasn't a pig or huge, she was now one of those typical suburban housewives you see everywhere. Yes, her breasts hung so low over her already large belly that everything merged into one big mass, and her butt sank even lower into her lower back. The years and the birth of two children had taken their toll, but I didn't notice it. Denise was still the woman I loved, and she was now the mother of my children. This created a bond that a little fat couldn't break. On the other hand, the years had been kinder to me. Being a department head and overseeing one of the most important parts of our business had given me more confidence because I was constantly put in situations where people relied on my expertise to solve problems. I became more comfortable in social situations. I also started exercising, and Denise's cooking added some weight to my skinny body. The final step was to give up huge glasses in favor of contact lenses. 
I think this all became a real problem when Mary Claire Thorpe, who was our nanny at the time, said something. We had a barbecue for Mary Claire because she had just received her associate's degree in child development. Of course, she still had many years of study ahead of her, as her goal is a master's degree or perhaps even a doctorate, but this was an important first step, and we wanted to help her celebrate. Mary Claire was a striking, albeit shy, girl. She was tall and slender but also had nice curves. Her breasts were no larger than the palm of your hand, but there was no trace of sagging. She had long, beautiful legs and a very attractive behind. I saw that behind many times when she was swimming in her pool, but it didn't make me lustful. I guess it was like seeing a guy's car with a supercharger. You appreciate it for what it can do, but when you're happy with your own engine, that's not a factor. So here we are, Denise and I, along with our children, Mary Claire, her brother Stuart, and a couple of neighbors. We gathered around our pool, giving Mary Claire gifts and congratulating her. Mary Claire was so happy that she drank several drinks and became a little tipsy. Denise just gave her our gift, a laptop. Before Mary Claire opened the box, Denise said, Here's our gift, Mary Claire. It might have something to do with the car, so you can return it and exchange it. But what can you expect when my nerdy husband picks out the gift? Mr. Tyler is no nerd, he's hot. I'd do that to him in a heartbeat, blurted a clearly drunk Mary Claire. Denise's eyes narrowed. Even though she knew Mary Claire was just drunk, I think she hadn't really looked at me for a long time before that moment. In her mind, as in mine, we were just two people in their 30s with kids and a mortgage like everyone else we knew. Hearing that I was hot changed everything. When we first started dating, in terms of attractiveness, she was a throwback star and I was never anything special. Knowing that the situation had changed, even if it was in the eyes of one drunken nanny, attracted her attention. Denise and I spent most of our time playing with our children and doing family activities. I think because of this, the spark in our relationship faded to the point where only coals remained. Women notice these things and tend to experience them internally. On the other hand, I decided that we needed to start some new hobbies we could do together to rekindle those coals. I had read several articles online about online predators meeting children in game rooms, and our children were getting close to the age where they would start playing video games. In most of the articles, the authors said that one of the best ways to ensure your children do not become victims or be bullied online is to play games with them. Since I had never been much of a gamer, I decided I needed some background. I went out and bought the biggest, most expensive gaming system I could find. I also bought a lot of the most popular games. I purchased a professional system with two processors and two monitors so that Denise and I could play together and compete with each other online. In terms of games, I bought Call of Duty 4, Unmapped, and C-Rim, all of which had great campaigns and amazing online versions. When I got home and connected the system, Denise looked at me as if I was on something. This will help us restore our relationship, I smiled with obvious intention. How will this help? she asked. Well, in two ways. I began. We will play some games together to get closer and improve our teamwork skills. We already have good teamwork skills, she said sharply. I know, I replied, but other than family activities, we rarely do anything together just for fun. In some games, we will compete with each other. We will compete for prizes, she asked skeptically. Well, it depends on the game, I said. It could be something the winner wants to do to the loser. Don't get your hopes up about perversion, Perry, she grinned. She smiled and laughed, but I noticed that she seemed more cheerful than usual. This happiness and delight continued until we started playing games. Much of my work involved the use of computers and various software platforms, so I adapted and learned very quickly. Denise, on the other hand, did not. In short, she was terrible. The first evening we sat down to play was a nightmare. We played as a two-person team in Call of Duty. Denise was killed before she even realized where we were. We started the game over, and she was killed before she even made a move. In just the first evening, Denise was killed so many times that she simply threw the controller in despair and walked away. The next evening, we decided to play against each other offline. What are we going to play for? I asked. Not what you hope for, she chuckled. Then I killed her 15 times in 14 minutes. 
Denise barely spoke to me for two days. I was about to give up on this whole video game thing and put it away until our kids were older, but then I received an excited call from Denise Saturday evening. What Saturday night? I asked. We'll play for what you want on Saturday night, she said. What are you talking about? I asked. You and I will play video games against each other on Saturday night, she said. If you win, you get to have special night with me. What happened? I asked curiously. Mary Claire's brother, Stuart, will be giving me video game lessons, she said. I was telling Mary Claire how hard you try to find things we can do together. She thought it was a great idea until I told her how terrible I am at games. Her brother came to borrow some money from her, he doesn't have a job, and when he saw our gaming system, he almost wet himself. He offered to teach me how to play games for only $10 a session if I would let him play on the system sometimes. So, mister, we're in for a battle on Saturday night. It was Monday when she called me, and we exchanged glances and smiles all week. Even when we had an intim that week, it felt like we were energized. To shorten the long story, it was Saturday. After we ate dinner and the kids went to bed, Denise showered and put on perfume. I took a shower and put on only a robe. We met at the gaming system, both wearing our best night clothes and smiling. The game was beyond the call of duty, and we played against each other. The first one to kill the other five times would win. As soon as the game loaded, I dove for cover and found Denise in the simulated terrain. Then, I took a breath and calmly pumped not one but two bullets into her head. This is one. I said. Get the lubricant ready. This was my last quick kill. Denise killed me five times in a row so quickly and mercilessly that I still don't understand how it happened. The last time, she somehow ended up right above me, hanging on a tree branch in stealth mode. This level of skill was far beyond my comprehension. I was angry, and she grinned. Come on, honey, she purred, pointing toward our bedroom. The next day, of course, was Sunday. I ran 20 miles and came home to relax until I had to wash the car. Hey, honey, wanna play a little? She asked. I told her no and that I was too tired but I would watch her. She was great. She knew cheat codes and combinations that I didn't even know about. By the time she finished, I never wanted to see that damn game again. When she went to make dinner, I sat down at the gaming system and tried playing another game. I tried Unmapped. It's a very difficult game, an adventure game that is so realistic that it's like playing a movie. You start out as Jim Columbus, a descendant of Christopher Columbus, searching for the city of lost treasures that Columbus discovered during his travels. Apparently, he decided never to mention this city in his journals because some secret power there could mean the end for all humanity. Basically, in addition to killing people and creatures, you have to solve puzzles and find your way through the game while being betrayed by some of the people closest to you. Denise saw what I was doing and came over to sit in her gaming chair. She joined my game and was terrible again. I smiled. I felt revenge. So we agreed on a rematch for a week from the moment of my defeat. This time, we would be playing Unmapped, the online version, which constantly generates new puzzles and new enemies. The first one to reach the treasure would be the winner. What are we going to play for this time? She asked. You already know what I want, I hissed. I just got up and went to wash the car. I played Unmapped a lot during the week. I got to the point where I felt like I was inside the game. I also spent a lot of time chatting on the internet and learning more about the game. What made this competition fairer was that she couldn't really prepare for it, it would be a different game every time we played. Saturday arrived, and we showered and dressed again. After putting the kids to bed, we sat down in our chairs and started the game. Of course, since she was better than me and beyond the call, she was superior in gunfights, but I was better at solving puzzles. She won, but barely. Repeating the previous week, she achieved her goal. Perry, I just love it when you do that, she sighed. And I love you. Buying this video game was the smartest decision we ever made. I'm glad you're happy, I said with a joy in my voice that I didn't really feel. What about next Saturday? She asked. What about her? I replied. We still have one game, and neither of us has played it yet, she said. I got out of bed and went to the game. 
I brought the box into the bedroom, and we read it together. You're in, I said. This time, it will hurt you. She smiled, but nothing I said left her confused. She lay down next to me and hugged me. What you want, she began. Not anymore, I said. Perry, you may not have noticed, but it's been over a week since we, she said. When I went for a run the next day, I was angry. Twenty miles is a long way, giving you plenty of time to think. Washing the car is another activity that allows the mind to find order and solutions to problems that bother us. During this time, I thought about how to prepare for next Saturday. One more thing I decided to do was a little dishonest but necessary. While Denise was preparing dinner, I calmly and casually walked around our living room, looking at a few things on the shelves and around the room. The next day, while at work, I turned on my computer and launched an application on my desktop that I hadn't used in a long time, but it still worked. We had several stuffed animals on shelves in the living room and other places in our home. A few years ago, when we heard horror stories about nannies, we bought some nanny cams to check on Mary CLA. Mary CLA was practically part of the family now. She came over to use our computers or the pool even when she wasn't babysitting our kids. But we wanted to be able to keep an eye on the kids from anywhere. I could check camera footage from my iPhone if the computer was unavailable. In this case, I moved one of the cameras so that it was looking at the game system monitors. I knew it was a bit of a scam, but I needed to know how Stuart made Denise such an accomplished gamer. I put the camera footage in a small window on my computer desktop. This way, I could work on a new program while I waited for her to train. I think I had been working on the new program for a little over an hour when I heard a sound. It looked like Denise was talking to someone. Did you win again? Asked Stuart, chuckling quietly for a few minutes while Denise smiled and nodded. There was another guy in the room with him. Stuart looked nothing like Mary CLA. He was a large, bowie guy who was already starting to go bald, even though he was only in his early 30s. He wore very thick glasses and, unlike the typical nerd, was very aggressive. He constantly expressed his personal opinions on various issues that were important only to him. He then turned the topic to whether Frodo and Sam would have ever found Mordor without Gollum's help. He assured me that they would have found it because the ring itself could have guided them. He claimed that the ring knew where they were going and resisted it, which is why it was so painful for Frodo to wear it. After this conversation, I refused to ever watch the Lord of the Rings films and did not allow them in my home. When Stuart gave us a box set for Christmas, noticing we didn't have one, I quickly threw it away as soon as he left the house. Will I get paid now? asked Stuart. Denise suggested that Stuart's friend might feel more comfortable outside on the terrace, as long as she gave him money. I didn't understand this, I paid Stuart. Besides, we had all morning and most of the afternoon, she said. Stuart looked at his friend, who was about to say something but fell silent under Stuart's gaze. He went outside, muttering something under his breath. Denise and Stuart watched him leave the house and heard the door click. Denise then pulled Stuart into the living room and knelt down in front of him. I pressed a key on my keyboard to start recording the video stream and grabbed my jacket. I immediately told my secretary that I had an urgent matter at home and needed to leave. Two minutes later, I was already in the parking lot. I didn't need to rush, I told this fat nerd that they had all day. The roar of my Mustang's engine was extremely loud in the early morning quiet of the parking lot. I passed several colleagues who had just arrived at work as they left the parking lot. I parked a block away and walked the remaining distance. The prominent sound of my car's exhaust system would have given away my presence had I not done so. I walked through the gate into the backyard instead of opening the front door and alerting them. I wondered where Stuart's friend might be, perhaps he went home. The back door was wide open. I carefully entered through the kitchen and found them. Stuart was having a night with Denise. Hurry up, Denise said. This is not what I like. You told him you had all day, I said loudly, causing them to turn in my direction. Denise quickly straightened up and Stuart almost fell. Perry, what are you doing at home? She asked in shock. Oh, damn, said Stuart, who couldn't help himself. I crossed the room, heading straight towards Stuart. His eyes continued to get bigger. Although Stuart was physically much larger than me, he knew what awaited him. Boxer Mike Tyson was once asked in an interview what was the best punch he ever threw. 
He said the best punch he ever threw was against Robin Givens when he was married to her. I was in this mode when my fist flew towards Stuart. I've never been much of a fighter, other than a few self-defense classes. I was mostly a reformed nerd. But that morning, I was amazed at my actions, as if I were watching from the outside. I understood exactly what was happening in the room. I was one with the universe at the molecular level. That's why I noticed that Denise's face was a mask of horror as she rushed toward me. Perhaps he had been the victim of too many video games, or perhaps the connection between intim and violence was too close for him to separate. Denise rushed toward me and grabbed my arm to keep me from beating Stuart further. She was holding my hand, and this weighed more than me, so reflexes kicked in. His shrill screams were probably heard in the next district. I looked at Denise and pushed her away from me. Perry, we need to talk about this, she said. What's there to talk about? I said sharply. You have saved your lover for now, but the next time we meet, things will be different. Get out of my house, all three of you. What are you talking about? She screamed. I don't have a lover. I tried to save you from jail. Our children need both parents, and we won't be able to figure this out if you kill Stuart. He's pathetic, look at him. Denise, just get out of my house, I repeated. Take Stuart and his buddy with you. Stuart was still lying on the floor, curled up in the fetal position. Meanwhile, Stuart's friend was crying and trying to open the locked front door with only his left hand. I crossed the room and gave Denise her keys from the counter. I opened the door and told her to take them with her. With difficulty, they lifted Stuart and led him out of the house. Denise tried to hug me before leaving, but I pushed her away. When we talk about it, you'll realize it's not as bad as it seems, she said. I'll be back as soon as I get them to the hospital. No, you won't come back, I said. Go to your parents or to hell, but don't come back here. Let your father come and get you enough clothes or something to last until the lawyers arrange for you to come back. Perry, don't say that, she pleaded. It was just a mistake. We won't become one of those divorced families. We'll work things out. I don't want our boys to grow up in a broken home. I love you. We just need to talk. I slammed the door in her face. If she hadn't jumped back at the last moment, the door probably would have knocked her off her feet. The heavy metal door frame cracked. I realized that I didn't have much time, so I called Mary CLA and said that I urgently needed her help. I asked her to pick up my boys from school and kindergarten and take them to my parents. I told her I was probably going to jail soon, but I didn't tell her why. Then I rushed to the bank and transferred all the money from my savings account, leaving my current account untouched. I closed the savings account so that if someone checked our accounts online, there would be no evidence of the existence of another account. I was confident that when Denise hired a lawyer, he would be able to find out when the account was closed and maybe even discover how much money was there, but he still wouldn't be able to get it back. I went to my boss, who was a friend and had been through several divorces. When you have as much money as he does, women just flock to you, and many of them don't have the best intentions. He helped me open an offshore account. I found another bank where I could deposit the cash and then transfer it to my offshore account. Denise's lawyers would have to try to check every bank in the region to trace this transaction, especially since I didn't have an account with this bank and I hadn't opened one. I still paid about $100 in fees, but it was worth it. I called my broker and cashed out my brokerage account. This account only contained stocks, some step bonds, and a few mutual funds. It was completely separate from my 401k account at work. I lost about 15% of the account value by transferring it to an offshore account. If I tried to withdraw it by cash or check, I would have to pay taxes, which would reduce the amount even more. I called my boss again, and he said he had an idea he was working on. He had a friend in Vegas at one of the casinos who was going to help us. He also told me to park my car in his garage. I asked my secretary to follow me to my boss's house, where he lived with his current girlfriend. We returned in her Honda, and I rented a car. I drove the rental car back to the house and noticed that the police were already there when I arrived. I smiled and waved to them. Mr. Tyler, there are two people in the hospital with serious injuries, one of the officers said. They don't want to file a complaint, but we'd like to hear your side of the story. I came home to find one of them having a night with my wife, 
I said. I reacted as any man would. You need proof? I asked. The two policemen looked confused. Come into the house, I said. They reluctantly followed me. I went to my home computer and turned on the recording. They watched the first part, which I had seen from the office. I stopped recording long before I attacked Stewart. Sir, I really understand what you're going through, the first officer said. I've been in that situation myself. Even though these guys don't want to file a complaint, we need to take you to the station to fill out a report. I think your wife talked them into not saying anything. You probably won't be there long. Oh, I'm ready, officer, I said. I don't mind sitting there for a while. I'm fine. My house has a front door and a back door. The back door has a special lock, so we were initially warned not to lose the keys to it, because replacing it could mean replacing the entire door. Denise almost immediately lost her key while on vacation. When I left home, I broke my front door key in the lock. My tailgate key was in the glove compartment of my Mustang. Surprisingly, I was not sent to prison, I was put in an interrogation room. They did not take my phone, wallet, or any of my personal belongings because I was not arrested. They left me alone while I waited for the detective to arrive. I called Mary CLA, who had already taken my children to my parents. She asked me what was going on. Your brother would probably be the best person to talk to, I said, but thank you for taking my children. I owe you one. I talked to my father and explained to him what was happening. He decided it would be best to say that he was taking the boys fishing with my permission. My father knew thousands of fishing spots, and my boys loved to fish. My phone rang almost immediately after I hung up, and it was Denise. I immediately disconnected the call. She called again, and I hung up again. The next call was from Denise's mother. I loved her, so I couldn't hang up. She asked me if I could go to the hospital and talk to Denise while she waited to hear about Stuart. I asked her how much she knew about what was happening. She said Denise only told her that we had a fight over something I did to Stuart and that she was trying to make things right. I decided it was better for Denise to tell her parents the truth. If she lies to them, I'll tell them the truth, I said. I couldn't go to the hospital because I was at the police station. Within five minutes of hanging up, I received a bunch of calls from Denise, none of which I accepted. Half an hour later, I told my story to the detective who was working the case. I was sitting and waiting to be released when Denise burst into the police station. Someone told her where I was and brought her to me. She ran up to me and tried to hug me again. I raised my hands and stepped away from her. Stay away from me, I said. Honey, we need to go home and figure this out, she said. There's nothing to figure out, I said coldly. After our divorce, you will have plenty of time to have an intim with Stuart and anyone else. Damn it, Perry, she said. You're the only one I want. We all have to want something, I said. But I'm the one you want, and we'll never have it again. Perry, we need to talk about this calmly, she said. I've made a lot of mistakes, but that doesn't mean I don't love you. You let that fat idiot have night with you, I said. Year after year, I've begged you for this. We've known each other forever. You've known him for a few months at best. I married you and supported you. He taught you how to play video games when you were sick. I took care of you. What exactly did he do for you? We have children together, and I thought we had a future. He ended our marriage, so now your future is with him. Well, you have all these memories of laughing at me behind my back, right? Perry, no one laughed at you, she began. I love you, Perry. Don't do this to us. I didn't do this to us, I said coldly. You did. Perry, you've never seen the real me, she said. When I was growing up, I realized that I would do anything to win. I'm too competitive. But I'm at a point in my life where I need to feel like I have control over something. You always treated me like a princess. You always loved and cared for me when no one else did. Even as we got older and I turned into a pig and you became what you are now, you always grabbed me and begged for what was always yours. Yeah, that's right. That's why you gave that man what you never gave me. Do you know how much that hurts? I don't want to talk to you anymore. Anything you need to say, say it through my lawyer. 
Perry, we need to talk about this calmly, she said. I turned away from her and childishly stuck my fingers in my ears, loudly singing, la 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 la. I watched as her face grew redder. Perry, don't make me do this, she said. La 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 la, I sang. She shook her head and took out her cell phone. She started talking to someone on the phone and then abruptly closed it. She looked at me again with anger in her eyes and stood up to leave. The detective returned to the room. Mr. Tyler, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to detain you, he said. The men you beat changed their minds and decided to file a complaint. Call me when you decide to listen to reason. Denise said it could have been very easy, but she forced me to show my anger. I was transferred to a cell. An hour later, Denise came into the cell to see me. Perry, where are the kids? She asked. I refused to talk to her. Perry, you're going too far. It's not what it seems. I need your back door key. It's not among your personal belongings, and something is broken in the front door lock, she said. Denise, the house is in my name only. I already told you I don't want you in my house. If you come in, I'll charge you with theft or trespassing, I said. Perry, you don't want to mess with me, she said sharply. There's still time to apologize, talk, and work things out. We'll go back to the way things were before, and everyone will be happy. We'll still spend the rest of our lives together, and years from now, this won't even be a dim memory. I'll even give you special night if it's that important to you. I don't want this anymore. All I want is to be free from you. I want to start my life over again with someone who loves me enough to be faithful. Her eyes filled with tears, and she understood. Perry, I never knew that, she sobbed. I didn't realize it was that serious or that you loved me so much. I think I just thought you couldn't find anyone else. Yep, it doesn't matter anymore, Denise. Let's just get a divorce, I said. Perry, please don't make me do this. Neither of us will be happy when this starts, she said. Goodbye, Denise, I said sharply. She left the room, and the guard came in to tell me that my wife was posting bail for my release. I asked him if I should accept money from her for release. Well, you can refuse the money, he said, but that would be stupid. Who does that? You're looking at him, I said. I don't want anything to do with that. Denise re-entered the room. Why do you want to stay here? She asked. We need to talk about this. But I can talk just as well here. I waved my hand and shouted to the guard, this woman is stalking me. I haven't even had my day in court yet. I don't want to talk to her, and I want her to be banned from further visits. I said. The guard led Denise out of the room. You'll regret this, she squealed, continuing to scream even when she was taken out of the prison area. The next morning, my favorite guard returned. Overnight, the cell I was in became filled with petty criminals. A few of us became friendly and were chatting to pass the time when the guard approached me. A woman has come to see you, he said. I already told you that I don't want to see my wife, I snapped. It's not her, he replied. This is another woman. Do you want to go to the room or just call her here? Call her here. It will be faster, I said. I should have known better when I heard the sounds of whistles and hoots coming down the row of cells. She walked through all the shouts and whistles with the regal bearing of a princess. You really set my brother up, she said. And Denise is beside herself with rage. What did Stuart do? I asked. I told her what happened, and her eyes got bigger than Stuart's right before my first punch hit him in the face. God, I'm so sorry, she said. I can't believe my brother would do something like that. His college career is over. What does this have to do with him going to college? I asked. The dean hates Stuart, she said. He's been on probation since he went back to school. The last time, the dean told him that if he misspoke even once, he would be kicked out forever. If so, he'll never leave my parents' basement. My father is ready to kick him out. Can you imagine being that age and still living in your parents' basement? They have to wait until he wakes up to wash their clothes. He has Lord of the Rings posters all over his basement and invites other misfits to play Dungeons and Dragons. I laughed, imagining this. Well, I came to get you out, she said. For what? I asked. 
because that's what friends do, she answered shyly. MC, you don't have that kind of money, I said. This is the money I saved for education, she told me. MC, I'll give the guards my bank card. As much as I appreciate it, I can't take money from you. But thank you, it really means a lot to me. She simply smiled and nodded. So you could pull yourself out at any time, she asked. I nodded. Then why didn't you do it? Three reasons, I said. Denise wanted me out of here. My being in prison makes her feel disgusting because she thinks it's her fault. She also can't talk to me while I'm here. Secondly, I need to be somewhere, and here, I eat for free. So this place is as good as any other place. And finally, until you came here, I had no reason to want to go out. She smiled at me again and walked out with the guard to process my release. She returned with the guard a few minutes later. Hey, this is the same account the other lady tried to get you out of last night. Who cares, he asked. I love this lady, I said joyfully. MC drove me home, where I picked up the rental car. We went to breakfast, and I told her everything in detail. When I told her about this before, it was the short version. This time, I felt relieved, like my soul had been unburdened. I told her everything, how I felt, how I found out about what was happening, and everything that had happened since then. In turn, she told me everything that had happened the day before while I was in prison. Denise spoke with Stuart several times and hired a lawyer. According to MC, Denise hired the most ruthless lawyer she could find, someone who won huge settlements for most of her clients, because the woman she originally hired didn't have a track record of winning. Denise wanted to either force me to return to her or, failing that, destroy me. MC hugged me and told me she was ready to help me in any way I needed. I hugged her back and told her that I might take advantage of her kindness, but having her next to me was more help than she could imagine. I drove back to my house to pick up a few things from the garage. I remembered that I couldn't get into the house without breaking something, which was good because as soon as I walked into the garage, Denise and some guy got out of the car. She walked toward me with fire in her eyes. Why the hell did you let some woman take you out when you didn't let me? She hissed. I wondered if that loudmouthed attitude had always been lurking inside the woman I married. I smiled and introduced myself to the man who was with her. It turned out that this was her lawyer. He was very professional and extremely polite. Answer my damn question. Denise screamed. And who is the one who pulled you out? Is this some guy you've been sleeping with all this time? I would invite you inside. I told the lawyer, but I don't have access to the house right now. I'm sure you'll need some sort of court approval before Denise can get her things. I'll try to arrange it for today or tomorrow. Thank you, he said. It makes perfect sense. I didn't even expect. Stop ignoring me and answer my damn questions. Denise screamed. Several of our neighbors looked out of their windows. Our neighborhood was very quiet, and screams like this usually resulted in the police being called. I know, I said, continuing to ignore Denise after interacting with her. You expected a lot of screaming and yelling. I'm not like that. She wasn't like that either until all this started. I assume you are going to serve me with a subpoena. Here is my mobile number so I can arrange to be served at a time that suits me. I'm not sure where I'll live. Are you going to live in the house? He asked. I sold the house, I said. I am the sole owner. My wife's name is not on the mortgage. I just decided that if we weren't going to live here as a family, there was no point in keeping it. His eyes became huge, and Denise began to cry. Could you please answer her question before she gets hysterical, he said. Denise, MC pulled me out. I used money from our account, or my account. There is no woman with whom I am cheating on you. You've been the only woman I've been with for the last ten years, Denise. I loved you until you ruined everything. She looked at me with watery eyes for a few seconds. The she was trying to become disappeared, but we could still have everything we wanted, she said. It was a mistake. My desire to win at any cost took over. No, Denise, I said. We can't go back to the way things were. There's no way to erase from my memory what I saw. There's no way I'm going to trust you again. Are you sure? She asked quietly. Maybe you're just still hurt and angry at me. 
Maybe if we give it a little time, you'll change your mind. I don't think so, Denise, I said. Well, can we talk about this, she asked. Can we just sit down like two reasonable people and sort out our differences? I'd like that, I said. Let's meet in the park at one o'clock. Why in the park, she asked. In case things get loud, I said. Plus, the park is a public place where we can both quickly leave. I hope we can work this out, she said. I'll see you soon. I walked away and got into the rental car. I called my boss and told him how everything was going. Don't be deceived, he told me. Her lawyer and other people spent the whole day yesterday finding out how much you earn and how much money you have in your retirement account. Stick to the plan. You also need to go to Vegas today. If she files for divorce, the legitimacy of many of our steps will be even more questionable. I met with the lawyer I hired and gave him information about Denise's lawyer so he could contact him. I told him everything I was doing, and he laughed until his face turned blue. I felt that he had gone through this himself. You know that I am officially required to report all your actions to the court, right? He asked. I nodded. I don't care, I said. The only thing that matters to me is that my children are okay. I love tuna, he said. It's a good thing I have short-term memory loss. I can't remember anything you just told me. When I left the meeting with the lawyer, I headed to the park. When I arrived, I saw Denise sitting on a bench in the old gazebo. Several people were sitting and eating lunch on the benches around the gazebo, but no one was close enough to hear our conversation. I walked over and sat on the opposite side of the bench from Denise. She noticed this and frowned. It seems like a lifetime since you came into the kitchen and pestered me while I was cooking, she said. Now it's like I have some terrible disease that you don't want to catch. She paused and looked at me, then continued talking. Perry, everything went wrong. I think there's something wrong with me. I don't act like the woman you knew for most of our marriage, and most of all, I regret what I did. When I think back on it, I realize how stupid it was. At first, I tried to blame some of the blame on you. I kept telling myself it was your fault because if you hadn't brought that stupid game home, nothing would have happened. I bought this stupid game because you were moving away from me, and I wanted to try something, anything, to get back what we had. I loved you more than anything in the world. Denise, I couldn't just do nothing. I understand it now, she said but what you don't see is the whole environment. Perry, you are an attractive man. I'm lucky to have you in my life. It wasn't always like this. Remember ten years ago when we first started dating? I was hot. Everywhere we went, people looked at me and wondered why such a hot woman was with such a nerd. I never told you this, but men always tried to pick me up when we went out. You went to the toilet, and while you were away, men slipped me their phone numbers or started conversations with me while you were around. But I never gave in. I think by then, I was already thinking about forever. I had my fill of guys who just wanted a quickie because I was hot. I could get this at any time. I saw the older women I worked with as a waitress talk about how hot they used to be, and then one day they woke up and discovered that they were no longer the same. All that was left of them from all those years when they were hot was a small one-room apartment they shared with a cat. I didn't want to end like this. I also noticed other women who were happy. They had homes, families, children, and husbands who loved them. I realized the difference between happy women and not-so-happy women in love. I looked at all the guys we used to hang out with and realized that although I slept with many of them and might again, none of them cared about me. There's a big difference between wanting to sleep with someone and caring about them. Even then, the only person I felt cared about me was you, Perry. That's why I followed you, and I'm so glad I did. I think the problem is that the balance of power has changed. Recently, you've become more and more attractive over the years, while I became the fat, saga breasted mom who still sees herself as that hot girl on the beach. Lately, no one even notices me, but many women around us say how hot you are. I think I really started to notice this three months ago at the MC's party. It became clear to me that you hardly need me. You didn't do anything wrong, Perry, it was me. You're still the same caring, funny guy you were back then, but I guess I just needed something. So I started ordering you around, and as you put it, I started moving away from you. 
I needed to convince myself that I didn't need you, and while I was doing this, you tried your best to take care of us and our children and keep me from moving away. The video game was a great idea and could have been perfect for us, but I blew it. You even showed me how much you wanted me by wanting to win. You acted like Intim with me was something special while I was exploiting it and only wanted to humiliate you. Until recently, I really didn't understand why you wanted that special intimacy with me so badly. I thought it was just a way to have power over me, and when you explained why you wanted it, I just wanted to cry because of how foolish I had been. I didn't realize you still loved me so much. But, Perry, you need to know something. I didn't have intimate with Stuart to hurt you or humiliate you. There was more to it than that. You probably don't remember, but we tried that kind of intimacy once a long time ago, ten years ago on our honeymoon, when you were drunk. I was ready then because I loved you so much that I would do anything for you. So you're probably asking why it didn't work out, right? Remember, Perry, it didn't work out because your size intimidated me. With Stuart, it was a different matter. I know it hurt you, Perry, but I didn't mean it. I just wanted to win this game, it was a way to have something to show off. When Stuart and I were alone playing games, I guess I just let things go too far. We started talking about the bet, and then he wanted to know what was at stake. The next thing I knew, he was saying that since he was helping me not lose, he deserved a share of the winnings when I won. The next day, I felt I had to give Stu a nice treat for his help in defeating you. Anyway, I was even more determined to win again. Stuart told me it would be even more difficult, but he knew a way I could do it. He told me what it would cost me and stated his price. He wanted real intimacy with me. I refused. I wouldn't let him get close to me again. But as the week went on, I realized there was no chance of winning. You are too smart at solving these puzzles. I hate losing, so I agreed. Besides the feeling of shame, it was an unforgettable experience. Stuart's plan was to cheat. I spent most of my time watching you solve puzzles. When you tried to go through the battles, I didn't. But, Perry, I didn't have to fight like you did. If you get shot, the game ends, but I couldn't die. I had a cheat code that gave me infinite health. So even though I was shot hundreds of times, I didn't die. Stuart told me what I had to do to win and what he wanted in return. I just shrugged. Stuart told me it would be close, and it was. You solved the last puzzle, and I could only watch what you did and use my secret cheat code to bypass one puzzle. This brought me to the end of the game and the final battle just seconds before you. I fought by just shooting everyone while you had to hide behind things and slowly make your way, and I won the game. When I received my reward, you were again a magnificent and noble loser. Perry, I wanted you so much, and then on Monday, you came in and found us. I was shocked, nothing seemed real. It was as if real life was just part of a video game. None of this is worth what I put you through. None of this is worth half of what we're losing. I think we need to figure out how we can overcome this. What can we do? What can I do to make it up to you? Denise, that's the thing. All I ever wanted was us. It's gone. There was no need to be attractive. You loved me when I was a skinny nerd with huge glasses. I loved you until I saw you with Stuart. Bodies and physical things are not important. I fell in love with a woman who smiled at me and loved me when others laughed at me. All of this was just between us, no one else mattered. You lost it all when you slept with Stuart. The only thing we need to do is understand what is best for the children. We need to discuss custody and how best to care for them. Perry, that's not what I wanted to hear, she said. I came here to find out what we need to do to get back together. I don't want to hear this nonsense. Now start thinking. Think of something we can do to fix this. She began to worry again, and her voice started to rise. Sorry, Denise, but this is all too much for me. Acting like a child and yelling won't fix it. We will never regain trust. The only thing we can do is start the next chapter of our lives as co-parents, and maybe one day we can be friends when the pain goes away. Joint parents, she screamed. She stood up from the bench and stared at me. Friends? I don't want to be your damn friend. You have two days to get your head out of your fifth place before we go to war. If you force me to act, I will take everything you have. I'll take all your money, all your savings, your house, and even your little car. 
She screamed so loudly and cursed so much that people around us looked at her. In two days, Perry, one way or another, you will either be with me in our bed, or you will be in a divorce. You'll sleep on the bare floor of a shelter and eat tuna straight out of a can while you work for me, she spat. And even then, I'll probably have Stuart or someone else, not because I want to, but just to make it worse for you. And when you retire, I'll get most of your retirement package, or at least half, so you'll have nothing left anyway. Is it clear? And one more thing, Perry, if I even hear that you are with someone else, I will destroy you. She then turned the bench over and went to her car. That afternoon, I went to Las Vegas. I stayed in a nice hotel and even gambled a little in the casino. The next morning, as I was preparing to fly home, there was a knock on my door. The man standing behind the door entered the room as soon as I opened it and handed me a folder. Most of the documents were on official hotel letterhead, detailing how I lost almost $200,000. Where do I get this kind of money? I asked. He just smiled and looked at me. You sold your house and cashed in your pension, he said. Then you lost all your money in the casino. Your boss, Justin, is my cousin. A few years ago, he lost almost a million bucks to the casino. He arranged all this. We even invited one of our relatives to move into your house for the summer. You need to complete this before the start of the school year. The children involved, my niece and nephew, will probably have to go back to their house to go to school. I smiled and nodded my head. I was so happy that I decided to stay another day in Vegas. I watched the show, ate a lot of fancy food, and even smiled at a few beautiful women. I wasn't ready for a new relationship yet, but I needed to practice because someday I would definitely start dating again. All that was left was the collision, and it happened much faster than I expected. The morning I returned, I stopped by the office to thank Justin for all his help and update him on the progress. My father was due to return with the children in the afternoon. One of the things that really surprised me was that Denise never asked about the children. As I parked my rental car in the company lot and dreamed of my Mustang, Denise's lawyer showed up. There was another guy with him, and Denise came up behind them. So, are we going home? She screamed. I just smiled and shook my head. Her eyes darkened, and her face turned red. She looked like a cauldron ready to explode. The guy accompanying Denise and her lawyer came up to me and handed me a folder. You have been served with a subpoena, he said. Denise's lawyer looked really apologetic when he started talking to me. I understand that this is not the best way to do it, he said. Your wife insisted. This seems too harsh to me. Perhaps you could bring your lawyer to my office, and we could have a meeting to discuss this calmly and perhaps start talking about property division or settlement. I warned you, Perry, Denise said with acid in her voice. When you are ready to listen to reason, I can make it all go away. But you should know that your trial on assault charges is coming up too. You could end up in jail again. I can make that go away too. She looked at me like a cat cornering a mouse. Anyway, I'll be back to my house soon, she said. Later that day, I met with Denise and her lawyer. My lawyer was there, but I did most of the talking. There were other people there from both sides. Denise brought Stuart and his friend, while I brought another friend, Justin. As soon as Stuart saw the guy I brought, he became extremely nervous. Are you ready to give up? Denise asked, sitting down. Let's get started, I said. Well, her lawyer began, we are filing for divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty. I burst out laughing, and everyone looked at me and my lawyer. What is it this time? Denise's lawyer asked. Let's go back 15 seconds, I said. Your client begged me to stay with her. Does it look like I was being cruel to her mentally or otherwise? He looked at Denise, and she was ready to explode. Okay, I said. Denise, I thought you would file for divorce due to irreconcilable differences, and I was willing to accept that. That way, no one would be humiliated, and we wouldn't have to involve Stuart and ruin his reputation. But I guess if you're trying to fight fire with fire, I'll have to provide a dose of truth. I changed my counterclaim to treason. Denise's lawyer looked at me in surprise and then at her. You didn't tell him why I was divorced, did you? I asked him. Your client didn't tell you why I'm divorcing her, did she? 
Well, he stuttered, it's a no-fault state, and you have no proof, do you? I picked up my iPhone and turned on the nanny cam video. His eyes rolled back as he looked at Denise. I need to consult with my client, he said. He and Denise went outside. We heard a lot of screaming and yelling through the door. I smiled at Stuart, who looked very nervous. When Denise and her lawyer returned, he sat down and said, We are willing to accept irreconcilable differences. I'm not sure I'm ready now, I said. After all the pain she caused me, maybe everyone needs to know what kind of person she is. But let's leave that for later. Continue your lawsuit. My client wants a house and primary custody of the children. She is seeking child support and spousal support. She wants her car and 60% of her savings and checking accounts, as well as her investments and half of your retirement plan. She also wants to suggest that you go to couples counseling to try to resolve your differences. I started laughing again. The lawyer looked at me again. What is it this time? He asked. You know that when you walk in and find the woman you love having a night with another guy, it really changes you. You start going crazy for a while. All I can say is that I wanted to close this issue. I wanted to leave her and start over. No, no, Denise asked, getting to her feet. What the hell did you do? I sold the house, I said. I sold it before you filed for divorce. I also withdrew all the money from my savings account. I thought I could go to Vegas and triple, or at least double, it and pay you back so we could go our separate ways and start over. You're with some guy who doesn't care that you're cheating on him, and I'm with a woman who can be faithful to me. But you didn't triple the money, did you? She asked. Didn't even come close, I said. Never gamble when you're upset. How much money did you lose? Her lawyer asked. That's it, I said. I still owe the casino several thousand. What about cashing out your retirement plan? Asked the lawyer. Surely my client has a right to something. I haven't worked there long enough to be fully invested, I said. And I was so upset about what Denise did that when I walked out of there, I told Justin to stick it. So he fired me. Since I'm not fully invested, it's not worth much. I had to sell my car to start paying off my debt to the casino, so now we only have Denise's car, which we still owe money on. Without a job and a place to live, I'm not sure how we will keep up with her payments. The children Denise didn't even ask about are with my parents. You're an idiot! Denise screamed. We'll have to start all over again. What I did was stupid, but this is worse. So will you both go to counseling and try to repair your marriage? Her lawyer asked, trying to win at least one point. No, I said. Denise sat at the table with her arms folded across her chest. What should I do now? She said. You will fight me for custody of our children, I said. Why? She asked. Why can't we just get back together? We both screwed up. No, Denise, you screwed up, I said. I was just reacting to what you did. She started crying and calling me all sorts of names. I won't even be able to find a job if I end up in jail, I said. If you agree to try to save our marriage, I will call Stuart. Don't worry about it, I said. Stuart is in more trouble than I am, and I actually have more control over it than you. You do? The man I brought is the dean of Stuart College. He's sick of Stuart's crap, but he owes me a favor. If Stuart doesn't drop the charges, he'll be expelled. That means he wasted all his parents' money and will never be able to return to university again. But she told me, Stuart said suddenly. I wanted to drop the charges and just move on. But she told me that if I didn't do it, she would claim that I assaulted her. We spent the next two days negotiating. We eventually agreed that Stuart would drop the charges. Denise and I agreed to get a divorce due to irreconcilable differences, and we would both find jobs and work out a way to share custody of the children. We each bought our own apartments with the remaining money from the savings account, then closed it and kept our finances separate. We assessed the exact costs of the children and decided that each of us would pay half. Denise was able to find work as a waitress. It was difficult for her, as she had not worked for 10 years and had gained almost 100 pounds. I even pretended to care when she complained about having to work every day. For about two months, everything went well. One morning, 
I called her to tell her that the woman I had sold the house to had put it back on the market. I said I was going to try to get a new mortgage and buy the house back. She started crying and said it was great news. I thought she would be upset, but not enough to cry. Sorry, Denise, I said. It will be good for the boys. They will return to their old rooms, and you can visit them as often as you like. Of course, they can still live with you every other week if you want, but I really think it would be better for them to live in a house with a yard where they can have pets and a pool, don't you? That's not the point, she said. Yesterday, I found out that I am pregnant. I was shocked. I know this is hard, Denise, I said. We'll just work a little harder, and we'll be able to handle three kids as easily as two. If we were still together, that would be great news. You don't understand, she said. The timing is completely wrong. More than anything, I wish it were your child, but it's not. My life is ruined. Have you told Stuart yet? I asked. I'm going today, she said. But, Perry, he doesn't have to know. Nobody needs to know. Couldn't we? No, Denise, I said. That would be wrong. There have already been too many lies and cover-ups. Look where this has led. But I don't want to be with him, Perry, she said. I want to be with you. Denise, this is just not possible right now, I said. Who knows what might happen in the future? A year ago, I never imagined that we would live separately or that you would carry another man's child. But this is where we are now. And all this because of this damn video game, she said. Video games ruin my life. No, honey, I said sadly. These are not games. Your refusal to keep your legs closed has ruined both of our lives. Over the next few months, things got better and worse at the same time. My summer residents moved back to their home state, and I got my home back. Denise told Stewart about the baby, and he denied it was his and hired a lawyer. I told Denise that I was willing to help her through the pregnancy until a DNA test could be done to confirm the baby's paternity. The boys moved in with me full-time because, as Denise's pregnancy progressed, it became increasingly difficult for her to care for them. She still visited them often. I convinced Mech, who had always been there for me, to move in with me and look after the boys full-time. She structured her fall school schedule so she could attend classes while they were in school. Denise also lost her job because she simply couldn't stand or move fast enough during her pregnancy. Stuart reluctantly allowed her to move into his basement. He only did this at the request of his parents, who were delighted at the prospect of their first grandchild. He and Denise fought like cats and dogs. On the other hand, Mech was acting more and more like a wife to me than anyone else. She did much more than just look after the boys. She took care of me too. She cooked, cleaned, and spent time with me. It was Mech who finally put the gaming system in the garage. One day, I came home, and she wasn't in the living room. Two monitors, a system unit, gaming chairs, headsets, and everything else associated with the system simply disappeared. The sofa and chair were moved to be directly in front of our flat screen TV. It was a much more intimate setting for a group of people to just watch movies together. Put the steaks on the grill, Mech said as I stood looking at the space the gaming system occupied. Everyone is waiting for you. The kids can't go swimming unless we go out into the backyard to supervise them. I got a pirated copy of the Avengers for us tonight. Um, where I started. Every time you look at that thing, you become sad, she said. Several months have passed. It's time to move on. Mech was wearing a swimsuit with a long shirt, which apparently was one of mine. There was a slight scent of perfume coming from her. For the first time in months, I began to let go of some of my anger at what Denise had done. That evening was perfect. It was a family evening, something I hadn't done in so long. Ever since Denise started pulling away from me and the boys, I tried my best to get her back. The boys settled down on the couch with popcorn, leaving only the chair for Mech and me. We squeezed in there together, and the contact was divine. She wrapped her arms around my waist and rested her head on my shoulder, sighing. Like most men, I absolutely hated the idea of snuggling up on the couch with a young, beautiful woman who was interested in me. I continued to miss my fat wife who cheated on me. 
Seriously, we didn't kiss that night, but it was so nice to sit and cuddle that I didn't see much of the movie. As summer turned to fall and Mac and the kids went back to school, we rarely saw Denise unless we were visiting her and her new family. This pregnancy was harder for Denise, and she often blamed it on my absence. That damn Stuart is useless, she scolded. He will be the worst father in the world. I am a 36-year-old pregnant woman. Why the hell am I sleeping in the basement? I have nothing. Denise became increasingly grumpy as time went on. The kind and caring woman I loved was gone. Mac and Stewart's parents often told us that she was only grumpy because she was pregnant. I wasn't sure about that. I think that while we were together, I was so busy trying to please Denise that she had no reason to complain. My strong stance and refusal to take her back really exposed her bad character. Denise and Stuart constantly argued about everything. They clearly hated each other and blamed one another for the state of their lives. Denise resented Stuart for ruining our marriage and her lifestyle. Stuart believed that Denise had destroyed his ability to socialize with other nerds and hold dungeons and dragons parties in the basement. His parents were tired of supporting him. Over the years, his father began telling him that he should be kinder to Denise because if it weren't for the child, they would have kicked him out of the house a long time ago. Stuart's parents also started treating my children as their grandchildren. It wasn't uncommon for me to drop Mac and the kids off at Denise's place, only for the kids to run to Stuart's parents for hugs and treats. They began looking at Mac and me, exchanging knowing glances. Mac would always blush two or three shades darker when she noticed this. In fact, we were all sitting on the back porch discussing a topic that was bothering Mech's dad when we heard the tragic news. Mech's father called us to his home, already in despair. At first, he talked about small things until the children were playing on the grass with his wife. So, Mary Claire knows you can't, he asked casually. Yes, dad, she said quietly. Perry knows I can't have kids. It doesn't bother him. So when are you two getting married? He smiled as usual. Mac blushed and looked away from her father. Dad, we don't, she began, but he interrupted her, pointing down at us. Then why are you two always holding hands and stuff? He smiled. I just don't want him to get lost, she said. This porch is pretty big. Of course, he said. It's amazing that no one has gotten lost on this porch yet. Maybe I should draw a map or a plan of the porch and hang it on the wall so no one gets lost. We all laughed, but Mac and I didn't let go of each other's hands. The reason I asked you to come here is because I can't stand it anymore, Mech's dad said. MC, you are 25 years old, you have your associate's degree, and you're working on your bachelor's degree. You have a job, your own apartment that you don't live in, and whether you like it or not, you have a family and a man who loves you. Don't deny it, Perry, I saw the way you look at each other. I don't want to talk about you too. I'm proud of you, Mary Claire. As he said this, he reached out his hand and gently touched her cheek. But I want to be proud of your brother too, he added sharply. This guy is 32 years old and still acts like a teenager. He's been in college for 14 years, and I'm tired of supporting him. I'm turning it off, and I need your help to do it. MC, since you don't live in your apartment, can I sublet it to your brother and Denise? I don't want my grandson to live in this damn basement. And you, Perry, you're already like my brother-in-law, so technically that makes Stuart your brother-in-law. Can you get him a job where you work? I mean, any job, sweeping floors is better than nothing. He went to college all his life, he must be able to do something. Just then, a very pregnant Denise came out of the house, holding a piece of paper in her hand and screaming, that damn idiot. She cried and cursed at the top of her lungs. As I watched, Mech immediately walked over to the boys to try to cover their ears from their mother's tirade. She looked at Denise and reminded her that children should not hear such language. Denise broke down and dropped the paper on the ground. MC's parents tried to calm her down. I picked up the note and looked at it, shocked. I then asked Mech to take the boys inside and give them something to drink. She offered them soda, and their eyes lit up. I started reading the note out loud after they left. Denise, I can't take this crap anymore. Not another day. I wish I had never met you. You are a top notch, and you have truly ruined my life. I don't understand why Perry was so upset at the thought of losing you. 
Now I see that I did him a favor. And you noticed that he wasted no time replacing you with my sister. Life with him was always ideal for her. Remember her party? She may have been drunk, but she was telling the truth. Mary Claire now has the perfect life and the perfect man she dreamed of. They were once yours. But while she's happy in her life in heaven, I'm stuck with the harpy from hell. My parents don't help, they moved you into my basement without even asking if I wanted it. They're trying to mold us into some kind of pseudo-family for reasons I can't understand. This is not the life I wanted. I don't want a child. I don't want to be a father. I don't want a wife. And I especially don't want you. You're not even the type of woman I like. You're fat, unattractive, and like I said, a, expletive. Even if you had other qualities, one thing remains, even if I loved you, which I don't, I couldn't trust you. Let's face the truth, Perry is an attractive guy. He's the father type. He had a good job and loved you. You were married to him for over 10 years, and he tried his best to support you, yet you still cheated on him. How can I expect you not to do the same to me? I don't even think the child is mine. I'm sure aliens placed my DNA in your stomach as an experiment. I also don't intend to work myself to death like Perry or my father. I'm not the hardworking type. I don't intend to work like a slave to support you and your children just because of some careless intimate. I'm too smart for that. So, with a less heavy heart and a much lighter step, I'm getting out of here and heading for greener pastures. Don't try to look for me. I won't be where you think. And tell my father that now he can rejoice. I'm finally leaving his basement. Sincerely. Stuart. When I finished reading the note, Denise just started crying. MC's parents tried to console her and told her that everything would be fine, but she didn't believe it. Life has this funny way of biting you in the fifth place when you do bad things. But I must say that in this case, everything ended correctly. Despite all the lies and intrigues, some bad things happened, but we survived them. So, I said, looking at the couple, do you want to buy this gaming system or not? The woman was clearly reconsidering her decision. The man began to nod. At that moment, their eyes were drawn to a female figure walking out of the house with two small boys behind her. Mom, I want to go to the pool, said my son, Johnny. She picked him up and kissed him tenderly on the nose. You have to wait a little, Johnny. You just ate, she said. This child called her mom. So, are you and your wife back together? The woman asked. She doesn't look fat to me. Did she go on a radical diet? Before I could say anything, an old and loud 1980s Yugo showed up on the lot with obvious signs of rust and body damage. The windshield was cracked, and all of the car's wheels had excessive camber, as if the car had been overloaded. A fat woman got out of the car, leaving the engine running. A much larger, fatter man with no chin and huge glasses came out of the passenger's side and began looking around my yard for things to sell. They both noticed the gaming system at the same time. I married an MC. I told the couple I was talking to, referring to the woman who had just gotten out of that car, if you can call her that, it's Denise. I wondered what she was angry about now. As we watched, Denise ran around the yard until she found a baseball bat. She took out crumpled bills from her bag and handed them to MC. Here's 50 bucks, she said loudly. It's mine, right? Mick smiled and nodded. No! Stuart shouted hysterically. You, Stuart! Denise hissed. I bought this, so now it's mine. As we watched, she raised the baseball bat over her head and hit the gaming system as hard as she could. She repeated her actions until pieces of plastic and circuit boards scattered all over the yard. Denise laughed crazily while destroying the once modern gaming system. You're going to ruin my life, aren't you? She shouted, striking the device again. Looks like you'll have to buy something else. I smiled at the couple. I think the gaming system is sold. Wait, the woman said. Now it's clear that you married the MC, but how did Denise and Stuart end up back together? We sat down at the table again, and I continued to tell the rest of the story. Over the next few months, everything happened unexpectedly. Denise gave birth to a baby girl who, unfortunately, looks exactly like Stuart. A DNA test confirmed paternity. 
She still lives in the basement with her daughter, but as you can see, they are not alone there. About a month after the baby was born, Stuart called his parents and begged them for help. He ran out of money just 100 miles from home and was caught stealing food. He got into even more trouble when the sheriff tried to arrest him, Stuart tried to run away and accidentally hit one of the sheriff's deputies. Although it was an accident, it is still a serious crime. MC's parents had to pay a lot of money to free Stuart. So now, Stuart, Denise, and their daughter, Betty, are not living so happily in the basement. Denise rarely visits our children because they are afraid of her. They started calling MC mom soon after we got married. The criminal record only made matters worse because now, with a felony conviction, Stuart has an even harder time finding work. Denise is watching him like a hawk. His parents insisted at their wedding that their daughter bear his last name. They still argue constantly, but they do have some small successes. Denise found work as a waitress again. She makes minimum wage, but most waitresses make good money from tips. Denise is so grumpy that she barely gets any tips. She recently bought Stuart a lawnmower, and he mows neighbors' grass throughout the neighborhood. Sure, he has to compete with most of the kids in the neighborhood, but he studied marketing in college and plans to expand the business to clear snow in the winter and remove leaves in the fall. Alam came over and brought me another Pepsi. She leaned over, kissed me, and returned to the boys. So everything worked out great for you, asked the man. I nodded. Buying that gaming system was the smartest decision I ever made, I said. At that moment, Denise's car stopped rattling and stalled. She stopped hitting the remains of the gaming system with the bat and tried to start the car. It wouldn't start. Denise started hitting the car and crying. What do you think of our story today? It seems to me that the wife has chosen one of the most unusual ways to cheat. What's your opinion? Write in the comments. See you in the comments.